Hey, hey, and welcome into the Big Ten Huddle. I'm your host, JR, and we have got a lot to talk about going on in the Big Ten. It's the football episode, so we're going to be talking all football all the time. It's the Big Three, the Big Three from last year. We're talking all Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan in this episode. We might hit on a few other things here and there, but those are going to be our main topics. We have Zach with us again from Big Ten Football Talk. Zach, co-host here on the Big Ten Huddle. How you doing today, Zach? Uh Uh-oh, Zach. Can't hear you. Let's go on over to Vince while Zach gets his uh, stuff figured out. Vince, how you doing today? Uh, Andrew and I are doing great. It's uh, we've had a couple sunny days in Happy Valley. So when you got the sunshine, there's not a better place to be. Very good. Very good. And uh, Andrew. Yes, Andrew from Nittany Blues Pod with Vince. Andrew, how you doing? Doing great. Uh, really excited to be on the show. So thanks so much for having us. We're excited to get into some blue white game talk, some County Lambert Smith talk and some other things. Yep, for sure. We're gonna have a good time. Zach, are you there? I hope. Yes, maybe. There. <laughs> All right. I don't know what happened. Well, I was, you guys could hear me like a minute before on pre show. So that's crazy. Do we're doing good over here. We're, we're just being silenced a little bit. But yeah, we're doing well. Yeah, no, we uh, we would never silence you, Zach. We we brought you right back <laughs> in, gave you the voice again. So we we yeah. appreciate that. Very good. All right, hey, let's get to our first topic here, guys. We have Keandre Lambert Smith. He has transferred out of Penn State. I know this was something that when I was posting about it on Twitter, a lot of people were asking about. It was a pretty pretty big news. Obviously, Penn State's leading receiver last year had 600 some yards. Sorry, I don't have the exact number. It was nearly 700. I know that. Uh, Julian Fleming, of course, has come into Penn State. So there are rumors, you know, has Julian Fleming passed Keandre Lambert Smith up? And I kind of said, like, doesn't really make sense. You know, you play more than one wide receiver. It's not like quarterback. So, uh, you know, obviously, even if Julian was going to be doing more of that, that it would still make sense he would be there. But uh, Vince, Andrew, one of you guys, just give me kind of your thoughts on what happened with Keandre Lambert Smith. And uh, do you think there's any solid story here? Or is this kind of something that everybody's still kind of asking about what went on? Yeah, so uh, just to, you know, quickly recap, um, like some of the sequences of events. So uh, shortly before the spring game, there were some rumblings that uh, Keandre was interested in possibly entering the portal and then he was absent from the blue white game both on the sidelines and on the field and then uh just yesterday i believe he confirmed that he did enter the portal so um yeah initial thoughts from this it's uh definitely you know a bummer just be you know from the standpoint that uh he, he was the number one receiver last year in terms of production but also uh just a guy who has been around the program for a while uh seemingly a really great dude um really positive influence on the rest of the group uh you know just a guy who um has been with the program now through a couple of coordinators a couple of wide receivers coaches so um definitely seemed to be you know rolling with the punches pretty well from that aspect so um not really sure what those conversations were like with uh new offensive coordinator Kotelnicki with Franklin and possibly with Fleming, you know, coming in as the new wide receiver, you know, kind of that new veteran presence there in the wide receiver group. So um, another team is going to be getting a, you know, a great wide receiver, definitely a plug and play number two receiver type of guy. Um, So it'll be interesting to see where he lands, but uh, yeah, it's going to be all eyes on the wide receiver group again this year for Penn state. So Vince, you got anything else on that? Yeah, this was definitely a shocking move on my part uh, hearing this. Uh, He was the number one wide receiver last year and really the kind of the favorite uh, along with Julian Fleming to be that first guy and be the guy. And when you wrap things through your head, you're trying to think, why why is this happening? We we can only speculate. Coach Franklin always keeps uh, internal matters internal. He doesn't really share too much about the players or stuff within the locker room. Um, some might think it's NIL money and he's trying to get a better deal. Um, I find that very unlikely. I don't think there's that many schools that are going to provide more money for him than Penn state. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Penn state really is one of those teams that prefers not to use the portal, uh, using it very minimally. So that, that was one reason why it was shocking. Um, some other things you can really speculate on, uh, maybe Julian Fleming was in the system and he wasn't happy with his role. Uh, maybe he wasn't happy with the wide receiver coach switch uh, with Marquise Haggins from Taylor Stubblefield uh, from two seasons ago when they won the Rose Bowl. 
Um, maybe he's not getting along with Kodal Nikki. Uh, these are all things we can only uh, speculate on. Uh, he is also a uh, graduating uh, after this semester, so maybe he wants to pursue something educationally as well. So at the end of the day, we really don't know. And the fact that he was really only the really the, the main proven guy that was consistently able to create separation and get open uh, definitely raises some level of concern for Penn State along the perimeter. Yeah, my first thought went to Kodal Nicky as well. The possibility of, you know, is he just unhappy with the offense or maybe is Kodal Nicky not using him in a way that he likes? Uh, I didn't even think about NIL because, you know, you kind of hear about schools who NIL isn't going so well, and I've not heard anything about that from Penn State. I've not heard that it's the best NIL in the world, but I've heard that, you know, I've not heard anything bad, which says to me that it's reliable and players are getting paid what they were promised. And I mean, that's kind of what you want right now in the NIL area era, right? You just, you, you really don't want there to be any news about your NIL. <laughs> you want it to be quiet and know the players are getting paid. So Zach, did you have any thoughts on Keon, Jerry Lambert Smith and what possibly might've happened here? I, I appreciated the the thought about maybe disagreement with the wide receiver coach or Kodal Nicky at offensive coordinator. My, my other question, I'd be curious to hear Andrew and Vince, you, your guys' thoughts, but do you think there might be maybe some, not disagreement, but maybe lack of cohesion with Drew Aller? Yeah, I mean, that is uh, certainly a possibility, um, you know, because – on the on the whole, the wide receiver group last year was uh, underwhelming. You know, we could we could say the production really wasn't there. There were always conversations and comments, even from Franklin himself, saying, you know, we need other guys to step up. Like guys need to start making plays, and all on the you know overall, like this this group needs to um, step up their game. And uh, part of that also definitely was quarterback play. I mean, Drew was Drew was fine but he didn't light the world on fire and there were plenty of ups and downs. Um, and you know, across all quarterbacks in the big 10, he had a pretty high percentage of uncatchable balls. Um, when you compare, you know, the starting quarterbacks across all the different teams. So that definitely could have played a part in it as well. Um, by all accounts, uh, you know, from what we've heard through spring practice, uh, things have been going very well in that aspect. Uh, things are progressing smoothly with, Kodal Nicky's new offense being installed into the system. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe though things weren't happening at a quick enough pace for Lambert's liking. Um, so I think, I think that definitely could be playing a part in it. Um, I think too, you know, another thing that I also thought was just like he similar to other players in the portals uh, stories. He's just a guy who's like been in, in one program for so long that maybe he just wanted a fresh start. Um, maybe kind of similar to Fleming in a way. I mean, Fleming, um, his situation is so unique because he was playing behind arguably generational wide receivers. You know, it's, it's really hard to be the guy when you have to play behind Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, uh, Marvin Harrison, among some others. But, uh, you know, sometimes you just want a fresh start. You want uh, a new look and just a, a new place to put some stuff on film that uh, guys are going to like in the NFL. So I thought that had something to do with it as well. But I think there is, there's probably some credence to that. Whether or not we're actually going to get the answer to that uh, is pretty unlikely, but we can speculate certainly. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, in terms of uh, Drew and not enjoying playing with Drew, there were definitely a couple of throws where he made Keandre look very good last year. And, you know, you can think about Haggins. But if that was the case, uh, why would he not just enter the portal after conclusion of the season? Now, it could be he just wanted to finish his Penn State degree and then get out. That's always a possibility. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we're really not going to know, and he will be sorely missed. Yeah, I think uh, Keandre Lambert-Smith, I don't think this was a situation like Keon Coleman with Peyton Thorne or anything like that last year. It seemed like, you know, he was just kind of quietly leaving. And I would say that, you know, typically when these guys get upset about something, they, they kind of make it known. Uh, now, you know, James Franklin not really talking about it much makes me think maybe there was something there. But uh, you're exactly right, Andrew. We really don't have any answers here. It's just kind of all speculation at this point. And 
Um, not, I, I don't know if we'll ever get an answer unless Conjuring Lambert Smith comes out himself and says something. So, uh, obviously, the thought here is the future. We're going to talk about the spring game and some of the guys we saw on it here in a minute. But, I mean, just at the wide receiver position in general, Andrew, you know, Julian Fleming's coming in this year, so that's good news. But you have some other guys here on the roster that they're going to be catching balls for the first time this season. Uh, Malik Mija, I forget how, I don't know how to say his name, but, um, uh oh. Malik Mija, he uh, he's also not doing super well, uh, or not not doing super well because he's in the transfer portal. Sorry, my lights went out there for a second. I don't know what went on there, but um, <laughs> he's not doing super well right now because he's in the transfer portal. But just what are your thoughts overall with this wide receiver position, Andrew? Yeah, so I think it's uh, really just going to be a tale of kind of the continuation of last year. Like guys are going to be asked to step up. Um, I think having Fleming there is going to be a huge help. Uh, just in terms of uh, maintaining some level of production there. I mean, when you look at uh, Fleming's career up to now, he probably has more catches and more yards than probably everybody else uh, in the wide receiver group combined. So that's that's uh, a level of experience and a level of, a level of uh, veteran status that you can lean on and Drew can look to. But yeah, I mean, there's still there's still so much talent uh, when you look at this group compared to you know, what their prospects were coming out of high school. You know, you have guys like Harrison Wallace, who's dealt with some injury concerns. You have uh, Caden Saunders, who was touted as being um, kind of that speedy slot receiver, a guy who can really break a game open. Um, and there's Omari Evans, and you know, there's there's a bunch of other names in there that were kind of part of this collective mix that Franklin, uh, you know, without, without being super on the nose, kind of said, you know, like someone needs to be wide receiver two out of this group. And, I mean, they had Dante Cephas last year at the – um, highly, you know, uh, highly touted transfer from Kent State that never materialized the way that they wanted it to. Um, and so they were just kind of looking for answers uh, for anybody who was willing to step up and take it. So I think it's really just going to be a matter of like someone needs to uh, step up and make those plays. I mean, the transfer portal is not uh, just getting immediately filled right now i mean we're only what like one day into it but there's not going to be a ton of new wide receivers coming through the transfer portal now at this point uh in the off season so they need they need the guys who are in the room right now to uh to you know to get have the drive to develop themselves and uh make sure that they make their presence felt in this new kotal nikki offense makes sense yeah i think those are some really thoughts? good I think those are some really good points. Uh, guys, I'm looking at to kind of fill the role of Keandre Lambert-Smith. Uh, you saw it on uh, the game on Saturday, tight ends. I think you're going to see the tight ends utilized more. Uh, me personally, I would like to see Penn State play a lot of two tight end sets with uh, Tyler Warren and Khalil Jenkins. Those are two of their you know, best players in terms of pass action options. So I'd really like to see them on the field more. I'd really like to see Penn State run the ball more and commit to the run more, uh, almost like Michigan did last year. Uh, with the defense they had last year and, you know, the, the running attack that they had, for some reason they got away from that last year. It was, uh, you know, both Andrew and I were kind of scratching our heads. So those are some ways I expect Penn State to handle it. Uh, some other guys I expect to step up for wide receivers are – um, Caden Saunders, uh, Mari Evans, and Trey Wallace. All three of those guys, they're smaller type wide receivers, and they're definitely speed guys. So they're guys that are going to really try to stretch the offense. Two years ago in the blue-white game, Amari Evans really stood out. I thought he was going to have a bigger season last year. Uh, you know, turned out to be a, a so-so season. So they're definitely going to be relying on that speed. And Drew is really going to have to – connect on those deep balls when he takes those shots because last year uh, Penn State just didn't take those shots. Drew was, you know, very good at taking care of the football, but he was avoiding those uh, smaller window throws. So he was more so managing the game. Uh, so that's going to be really important. Um, they have to hit on those deep throws, utilize the tight ends. And uh, lastly, we didn't really get to see the two of them together. Julian Fleming was playing on the blue team this past weekend. So uh, my question for you guys is being Ohio State guys, do you think Julian Fleming can assume the role of a number one receiver and really stand out at Penn State? Go ahead, Zach. Oh, that's a hard question. That's why I, I gave it to you first. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure he can be a number one. I, I, I think he, which is why I think Keandre Lambert Smith leaving. I didn't think 
I didn't think Keandre Lambert Smith was a solid number one either. I thought both would be good number twos, but if you had both of them together, I thought that could at least take some pressure off of each other. Um, I, I think what I love about him is his physicality. And he, I thought he became a great blocker um, at the end of his career. And I, I just don't know how much of that is, be, it, it, how much of his uh, maybe lack of production. Part of it was certainly you had Marv, you had Emeka, you had Olave and Garrett Wilson. But I think part of it was the injuries. And so how much of his limitation was because he's been injured? Um, you know, he's dealing with shoulder injuries. From all accounts, he was a great teammate, great presence in the locker room. And so I, I hesitate to, to fully say no, because I think if he commits himself and I think if he, you know, if he plays like he did back in his Southern Columbia days, right, and, and he can really uh, get back to 100%, I think, yeah, I think that there's, there's a possibility. But I think from what he's shown to this point, I think really solid number two may be a stretch to be a number one. Yeah, I think uh, Julian Fleming is a good player. I think that he's a very good team player, uh, which I appreciate about him, and I think that will bring a lot of good things to this wide receiver room that needs kind of some leadership, it seems like, in the room. So that's going to be an excellent piece there. Do I think that he's going to be your traditional, you know, wide receiver that you're going to be able to go to whenever you're in a pinch and kind of bail you out? Unfortunately not. I just don't think he's that kind of player. I think that he gets good separation, not great. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think he's a very uh, willing blocker. And if he just learns how to block a little bit better, because some of the angles he took last year were were the issues. Yeah. It wasn't the issue of, I mean, you know, Ohio State kind of has an issue with wide receivers not always wanting to block. That wasn't the case with Julian <laughs> Flipping. He wants yeah. to get in there. He wants to hit the guy, but sometimes he doesn't always take the right angle. So I completely agree with what you guys are saying about, or I think you said, Vince, with like the running game and it, you know making that better, especially if you're going to run to Julian Fleming's side. He's going to take out a cornerback for you as long as he knows how to block better and take those angles the right way. And so you could really see the running game flourish this year. And uh, although you know Drew Lauer might not have that you know bail you out wide receiver, you could f- still find a wide receiver that's able to do the right things, do the simple things, and provide him a target most of the time. So that's yeah. kind of where I go. With it. I, I was just going to one, – one thing, we I, I I get to cover the area that Julian Fleming came from in high school during the fall. And I, I think one thing that was – that has been very apparent is whenever Southern Columbia plays, they are just bigger, faster, stronger than everybody else. So I think a lot of the recruiting hype with Julian Fleming, you know, he was just bigger, faster, stronger than every everybody else that he played against. And even in a running offense, like he he just piled up yar- yards and touchdowns. I mean, I think he broke all the state records. And now he's, in, you know, now he's playing in a conference with guys who are as strong and as big and as fast. But because of the disparity, I think that's what got him such a high ranking when he was coming out. And and I, I really, the, the guy who I think of, who I think he could be, um, and this is from an Ohio State perspective, but almost like, I, I think he could be like an Evan Spencer type receiver where he, yeah, team guy, leadership, I think, yeah, really puts in the effort to block, just needs to do a little bit better. But I, yeah, I, I just don't know yeah, I just don't know if he can be the guy, the, the true number one. Makes sense. All right, guys, that was a good discussion there about Keandre Lambert-Smith. We do have a couple comments here. Dylan from BXP. I'm typing while live on the BXP, the Boiler Express pod, so dedication there. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. We appreciate you watching and podcasting at the same time. And Troy, great blocker. Not sure he'll benefit from being – the guy who gets doubled more often than not. That is very true, Troy. Uh, good mm-hmm. point there about the doubling. And, uh, yes, Julian Fleming was always known for his blocking. And that will be missed at Ohio State. I mean, you know, some people yep. act like, oh, Julian Fleming left. But, I mean, he will be missed, at least to me, at Ohio State because he did do 
things like that. So, yeah. All right. Let's get into spring game recap. Well, Penn State had their spring game this weekend. It was a blue versus white game. This is one where you saw uh, James Franklin kind of divide the team into two uh, evenly matched teams. I know there were some people saying it wasn't all that well evenly matched. And I know some people were complaining about Julian Fleming being on the blue team and Drew Aller on the white team. And, you know, maybe you switch that up during the game. I don't know. When you get into that, it's always kind of like, you know, these spring games, you could always do something a little bit different. He, he threw to him, what, 14 other practices? <laughs> you know, I, I would hope that one practice wouldn't uh, phase him too much, but uh, Andrew, we'll go back to you again. You know, what were some things that stuck out to you in this game, good or bad, whatever you want to start with uh, in the spring game for Penn State? Yeah, so I would say uh, the overall takeaway that I had from it was that the defense definitely looked to be ahead of the offense. And, uh, you know, part of that is just because of the sheer amount of depth that the defense has across, you know, mo most of the position groups. But also, uh, you know, it wasn't super apparent if you were watching it on TV, but the conditions uh, for offense were brutal. Like we're talking uh, very high wind gusts, just a overall gusty day. I mean, we can we could tell you some horror stories uh, from our tailgating before the game even took place. If we want to get into that, we can spend a few minutes on that. But uh, yeah, it was it was a tough day, like throwing the ball um, anywhere. So, you know, when you couple that with uh, a new offensive system that they're trying to implement, most of the first team offense, not not together. Some most of them or some of them weren't even playing in the game. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't a huge like offensive showing by any stretch of the uh of the imagination but uh defense definitely showed up uh saw lots of guys making some or having some great performances uh guys like aj harris uh transfer from georgia the cornerback uh, he looks to be a natural he looks just as good as advertised uh great in uh run defense and uh pass uh, pass blocking, all that stuff. I mean, he just looked great. Um, Amin Vanover, um, senior defensive end, he actually ended up being the MVP of the game, voted on by the team. Um, he he actually had an interception, which is something you don't usually say too often about a defensive end, uh, but he looks good. And uh, considering that they're going to be replacing Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac, both going to the NFL, like that's what you want to see. Um, and on the other side, you know, on, on the defensive end side of things, um, Abdul Carter looks like he's uh, he's a natural at defensive end. Um, there was a lot of hype, a lot of excitement about his moving from linebacker uh, to defensive end, and he looks like he is just you know right at home. He's so fast, he's so twitchy, and so instinctive in getting to the quarterback. He looks like he was shot out of a cannon, um, and so the you know. It, even though it was a scrimmage, those those tackles didn't stand a chance. So um, that's what I really like took away from it. Um, other guys, you know, on the offensive side of the ball that I thought had some good performances, Quentin Martin, a uh, true freshman running back from the Pittsburgh area. Uh, he, you know, Franklin has been kind of what I would say like lukewarm about Quentin Martin so far uh, through his tenure at Penn State kind of keeps saying, or maybe he's like subverting expectations by saying, you know, He's still a little raw. He's still figuring things out. He's still, you know, learning, but we expect big things. And I mean, he looked great. He scored two touchdowns. He looked fast. I mean, he was, and he, I'm pretty sure he was running against the, uh, the first team defense. If I'm not mistaken, maybe Vince can correct me on that, but he looked, he looked really good. He looked, he looks college ready. Um, other guys, you know, we were just talking about the receivers, uh, Harrison Wallace, um, looking good coming off of injury. He led all receivers, uh, had a couple of nice catches. Um, and one thing that I, uh, that really stood out to me was that they were scheming guys open. And that was something that was a constant um, topic of discussion last year was Penn state, not giving guys easy enough looks to complete passes. Some of those uh, pitch and catch sorts of plays to get the quarterback into a rhythm, get him comfortable in the game stuff like that. We saw some of that and that was kind of a breath of fresh air, especially with a guy like Wallace who can uh, do some good things after the catch, super speedy guy. Uh, so hopefully he'll be um, healthy this year. He dealt with an injury bug last year because he's really the kind of guy that if uh, things kind of all fall into place, he could be that number one guy. There's just, you know, a couple of uh, certain pieces that would need to um, be in place there. And then, um, Finally, the, you know, the big thing for me was that the pipeline of tight end really continues for Penn State. Uh, you know, we saw uh, Tyler Warren really take off last year. He's back this year, but uh, there's also um, a slew of really good tight ends underneath him that are really young uh, guys like Khalil Dinkins, Jerry Cross. But we also saw uh, some redshirt freshmen and true freshman guys like Joey Schlaffer and Andrew Rappelier really shine during this game. Um, Andrew Rappelier especially is a five-star guy. So, you know, 
there's going to be a ton of expectations placed on him. He looks just as good as advertised as well. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to see what they have in store. But I would say, you know, um, expectations coming out of this game with the caveat that it is a spring game. Defense looks like it's ready to roll in 2024. Uh, Tom Allen is going to have those guys ready. And Kotal Nicky's offense, you know, it's still gelling, still coming into place. Uh, so we'll have to kind of wait until, you know, the first, like, week or two into the season to really um, see what the early returns are going to be there. Yeah. Andrew, you kind of stole most of the guys that I was going to say, so I'm going to be echoing <laughs> what Andrew said. But Quinton Martin, he looks like a stud out there. Uh, being a true freshman, uh, I thought he looked great. Uh, he, his vision was fantastic. Just hit the hole at the right time. The line looked good. I was really pleased with that. And if you're like a Penn State fan who looks into the future and worries about the long-term health of the team or the running back position, I think he's going to be the next stud running back at Penn State with uh, Nick Singleton and Kate Tron Allen expected to declare for the NFL draft next year. Really pleased with his performance. I thought uh, Trey Wallace and Caden Saunders did a really nice job of creating separation deep and getting open. Now, Drew is pretty inconsistent uh, connecting with those two, but you know, at the end of the day, there was a 55 mile per hour gust. And I've lived in State College for over about nine years, and I've never had a day that windy in my life. So I, I imagine that's very difficult. Uh, we were having a tough time in the tailgate a lot. Like, broke our metal tent in half. It was, it was crazy out there. So uh, definitely uh, the conditions might, may have played a factor uh, really pleased with how the tight ends look today. Um, you know, that's my favorite position to talk. One of my favorite positions to talk about Khalil Dinkins continue to look great. And he was a guy last year who like, he had like maybe 10 catches and eight of them were like first downs or touchdowns. So he was a guy they could really rely on in clutch moments so really happy with those things on the offensive end. Uh, defensively, Abdul Carter, uh, he's, a, he's a scary man. Uh, there were times where he was so fast. Uh, there was one play I recall, Joey Slaffer didn't even touch him. Uh, he was so quick around the edge. And if like the quarterback was live, he would have been drilled. So Abdul you know, added a little bit of muscle in the offseason. Uh didn't lose any of his quickness and he looked, he looks really good. Like he looks like a top 10 overall draft pick right now. Uh, really impressive. Uh, mid van over a uh, really great game. He had a sack and an interception and he made a comment after the game that, Hey, I don't get many opportunities at these. If I have an opportunity, I'm going to capitalize. And he said last year, in his opinion, they were the best defensive line in the country. And he said, there's no reason for that to change. So you know, I'm definitely on that bandwagon. They're up there with one of the top defensive lines of football. Uh, you got Devon Ellis returning, uh, Zane Durant, uh, a lot of good guys on that, you know, front four. So I think that's going to be a, a big strength of the offense. You saw Zaki Wheatley get an interception. Uh, AJ Harris had seven tackles on the day and a pass breakup. So a lot of things to really be encouraged about with the, the Penn State offense and defense. Yeah, it really seems like Tom Allen has a lot of toys to play with here, you know, a lot more toys than he probably ever had in Indiana. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm excited for Tom Allen to be able mm -hmm. to have this defense. I was saying all last year, I was like, look, Tom Allen's going to get fired, but he's going to go somewhere and be a very good Big Ten defensive coordinator at some point. It just is a matter of who's going to snatch him up first. And when Penn State snatched yep. him up, I was like, well, all right, I was already a little worried about Penn State, so here we go. I'm going to be even more worried again because, yes, Manny Diaz goes away, but guess what? Tom Allen comes in, who is arguably, if not a better uh, defense coordinator than Manny Diaz was, in, in my opinion. So it's it, it's a really good ad for Penn State, and I like the, uh, the the movement of Abdul Carter from linebacker to edge, I think, the, or defensive end, whatever you call it these days. But uh, I think that he's a better fit there. I think that he has more speed to get around there. Um, I think that his tackling ability, fits a little bit better there being able to get in the backfield and instead of the some of those open field tackles that he seemed to struggle a little bit with last year but yeah I think coming out of this game I don't I mean I, I saw the stupid videos on Twitter of like Drew Aller overflow overthrowing people and I'm like well maybe we, maybe we should watch the game people don't you know take one Twitter <laughs> video and say oh there you go Drew Aller stinks it's like no he was throwing into mm -hmm. wins that were you know very very hard to throw into so um, yeah, Zach, your thoughts on the game overall? Well, I, 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 
really agree with that assessment because I, I remember, I, I think I saw on Twitter, here are the, the non-highlights of Drew Aller. And I'm like, yes. listen, you don't know the context. You know, Fleming was on the other side. The win- I didn't know about the wind, but that, that's a really helpful insight. But I, I like I, I really the main thought I had as we were talking and I, I'm Jr. you kind of took it from me is I think no, I mean, but I think it's I, I think it's because it's true. I think Tom Allen is in the position he is supposed to be in. I never thought he was a good head coach. I didn't think that was his in a sense, his calling. But I think he has ended up, I think, very similar to Chip Kelly at Ohio State, which is they just want to coach football. And I think Tom Allen is in just such a great spot. And that defense, you know, when you said A.J. Harris, I'm like, of course Penn State has a great corner. They always have great corners. Their secondary has been one of the best in the country for the past several years. And I think same thing with the defensive line. I think Abdul Carter being at edge is just going to be – it's going to wreak havoc uh, on all the Big Ten offenses. So I I am still high on Kotal Nicky as a coordinator, you're putting in a new system. So I, I think all I'm really adding to this is a yes and amen to everything you guys are saying. Cause I, I think the defense looks great. I think the offense it's, you can't tell yet. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is uh, what you just said about Tom Allen was really close to uh, what we said during our conversation with Sammy from the Hoosier huddle. Um, Cause he had, you know, similar thoughts on like, Allen's prospects as a head coach and you know things were you know okay but not great but uh coaching defense was really where his his natural home was um his personality is perfect for it his energy is perfect for it um his background as a linebacker is a really strong fit for Penn State and you know the guys that they have available to them you know namely Apple Carter and others so uh it's just kind of funny you know it seems like everybody's kind of on the same page uh in that regard Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Smart fans are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of crazy that we didn't even really talk about this, but uh, you know, being linebacker, you uh, Abdul moving from linebacker to defensive end. Uh, linebacker was one of the positions where Penn State had a lot of depth, and we had very low concerns coming into the season. Uh, Kobe King is coming off a great year. Uh, Dominic DeLuca is a veteran leader on the team. Tyler Edston Elson is back. He's a veteran. Uh, Tony Ross, I expect him to step up and have a big year in year two. Uh, he didn't get too much playing time being a true freshman, but Penn State likes to sometimes sit the young guys uh, and give them time to learn and uh, get experience before being thrown into those big games. So a uh, linebacker, I think, is uh, another area where Penn State is really strong too. Mm-hmm. As you would expect from Penn State to have strong <laughs> linebackers. Uh, very good. Very good. All right. Hey, we're going to get into the Ohio State spring game. Before we do that, we are going to uh, remind you to please do like and subscribe. We appreciate that to the channel here. Uh, it does help us out. And uh, leave a comment after the show. If you are watching this on record, leave a comment. If not, let us know what you're thinking in the chat. We're also going to check out an ad really fast, and then we'll come right back after about 45 seconds from that. So we'll be right back. Looking to rep your alma mater or your favorite team in style? Look no further than Home Field. Home Field, based in Indianapolis, is your go-to destination for premium collegiate apparel. With a passion for comfort and a flair for vintage design, Home Field brings you officially licensed gear that is cozy as it is stylish. With over 150 colleges to choose from, Home Field digs deep into the archives, uncovering forgotten logos, iconic mascots, and legendary moments to create apparel that is truly one of a kind. Head on over to homefieldapparel.com. Use my code TBTH for 15% off for news, new customers or use my link in the description. If you're a serious college... All right. CBB Analytics doesn't pay for the football episode, so we're going to go away from them. All right, Zach, I think this is be uh, me and you, our specialty a little bit more here. The Ohio Sp- Spring Game recap, positives and concerns. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll let Zach go first. I'll go, and then Andrew, Vince, if you guys have anything to add or any questions to ask, we'll go there to you guys. So, Zach, why don't you take it away? Um, I, I thought the, the first thing that popped for me, the defensive backs, man, <laughs> they are good. They were very good. I mean, I mean, they they were on Abuka. I mean, Abuka made some great, 
plays in this game. You know, the one-handed catch down the sideline. But, I mean, he was getting some separation. But, like, you have really good receivers. And it felt like the, the defensive backs were like Velcro. I mean, they just were not letting them get by him. And, you know, you could tell they wanted to get a touchdown to Jeremiah Smith in the first half. Like, they were force-feeding it to him. And I think Igbenosin had a really good uh, breakup. I, I think he got a little bit of – out of all the corners last year, I think he was criticized the most. But I thought he played really well. Jermaine Matthews had some good reps. So I just think that that whole defensive backfield is deep and strong. You know, I thought Devin Brown and Will Howard, they look like they're the, the two leaders in the clubhouse. Uh, I thought they played well. Uh, the other quarterbacks, you know, they had good moments. But, uh, you know, Julian Sayan, who I think people are like, maybe he could be the guy. He had, he had freshman moments. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the one pick in particular. I think it was McLean who picked him off or Simpson Hunt, one of those guys. Um, but, you know, so I thought they played – I thought the offensive line – there's been some criticism of the offensive line. But for what I expected, which I, I kind of still expect them to be a dumpster fire, um, they, they were much better than I expected, particularly the first the first unit. The, the second and third units, eh. But my, I think the, at least the first team offensive line, they have shown that I think they've gelled and improved at least some, which is encouraging. And then Quinshawn Judkins. Uh, that guy showed he is going to be a really good running back for this team. So though, there, I think there were several positives, but those would be the the three or four that that I would really put put forward. Yeah, I really like Quinshawn Jenkins' running style. It's a shame that they weren't tackling him or Travion Henderson. I think that was what everybody's <laughs> problem was with the spring game, which it's my problem too. But I get it. You don't want your guys to get hurt. You know, it is what it is. Uh, they yeah. had full tackling for James Peoples and Sam Williams Dixon and. Uh, those guys look better than I thought they would. So, uh, you yeah. know, those are both freshmen, and they didn't look like they had many Julian Sayan freshman moments or anything <laughs> like that. So they looked good. Um, I'm with you on the offensive line, Zach. It, it looked better, but not great. I think that Ohio State will be shopping in the portal most likely for a guard uh, or a tackle to play on the right side. We'll see what happens there. Uh, I know they're going to lose at least a couple uh, more guys in the portal. I've already heard rumblings about that. And, those guys are just kind of waiting their time to do that. So I don't know if they're going to be from the offensive line or what, but but we'll see. Uh, Ohio State, I feel like Ohio State's going to do a little bit of the stuff that Penn State was uh, doing last year with the wing tee. So I thought that was mm-hmm. interesting. You know, Penn State kind of modeled have two really good running backs and how to run with them. And so now Ohio State's doing it with uh, Quinshawn and Trevion, which I tell you, I mean – there are some of the best running back combinations of all of the nation, if not the two best running back combinations in, of all the nation going on right now in the Big Ten, which is super exciting to me. Um, but I do kind of question the run defense still. We'll see uh, with two yeah. linebackers. It's really, really hard to gauge you know, how that is. But, I mean, Trevion had over five yards per carry on like three or four carries, and so did Quinchon on, I think, four or five carries or something like that. So, uh, you know, but, again, they weren't tackling them, so – how much can you really? <laughs> how much can you really say? Um, but you know, to me, the biggest the biggest thing out of it was the quarterbacks. Um, neither one threw downfield hardly at all. And is that their yeah. inability to do so? Or I mean, let's remember Ohio State's defense last year gave up the least amount of big plays out of anybody in the nation. I think it was like 50 plays or what was it, 20 or 30 yards or more, something like that. Plays uh, they gave up the least amount of those in the nation. So. Obviously, if that defense continues to do what they're doing, it's going to be hard in a spring game for Will Howard or Devin Brown to, to make those decisions. But uh, I think Will Howard is going to be the starting quarterback here. Uh, Devin Brown is very good, too. But um, I think that he misses his reads sometimes, and especially in the spring game, he was a little bit more apt to uh, to run with the ball when he had a read or two in front of him. I mean, there's a bubble screen. He just completely didn't even do this bubble, the bubble screen. I was like, why are you not – throwing the whole screen but i mean to his credit his blockers were downfield and they were blocking so you know like it, it worked yeah. he, he picked up yards but still it's like you know you don't need to go out there and get yourself hit and get yourself hurt so it's an interesting thing but andrew we'll go back to you first again any thoughts on the spring game or questions for me and zach yeah so just from watching the highlights uh i think 
the DBs was the was the star group of the show, like you said, Zach. Um, those guys, uh, Ohio State, DBU, like there's always guys in there that uh, you can point to to just have uh, just really stellar years year after year. Um, I guess I would say the main question that I have is uh, Caleb Downs. I mean, he was kind of the punctuation mark of what was you know an amazing kind of resurgence of talent, uh, gathering of new talent for Ohio State. Uh, the guy coming. Um, the freshman All-American from Alabama, uh, did he shine specifically? Like, did he really stand out for his performance or did he just have like a couple of like key moments before they pulled him out? Like, what was what was his performance like? Yeah, so I went to the game instead of watching on TV, um, specifically because I wanted to watch the actual secondary on the TV copy. You don't really get to watch the secondary sometimes, but um, and also to be with my family. But you know that's number two. So, <laughs> um, but no, uh, Caleb Downs, like at least from my football knowledge, obviously I'm no Jim Knowles or anything like that. But from my football knowledge, I never saw Caleb Downs out of position. He didn't really make all that many plays because he didn't have to but i mean that's also kind of what you want you want your safety to not have to do a whole lot and he's the one that's going to be back in coverage more often uh the other starting safety lathan ransom he's still out with his injury that he suffered at the end of the year last year so they're kind of slowly bringing him back he'll be a, a great addition to helping the run defense but i mean everything i saw from him like if you know it's one of those guys that he was just kind of quiet on the day and not because yeah. he didn't do anything well like it's because everything he did was solid and at the end of the day like you know it's kind of what you want uh, coming out of a safety is, you know, no big plays, just, you know, be in the right position. So what are your thoughts, Zach? Yeah, I was going to say, I, you, ironically, with the TV copy, I think the only time we saw him on TV really was when he was walking in or out of the huddle. <laughs> and <laughs> that's that's like it. But I think part of it, and I think to your point, JR, I think most of the plays either went away for him or it was routine. So, which, I mean, I think – you look at, I think they threw a, a lot more in this game too. And often it was one-on-one -on -one coverage. And I think that's why we're sitting here saying the corners really shined versus, you know, the safeties. They didn't have to, at least, at least when Caleb Downs was in, he didn't have to do much. Now I think is, is uh, McLean, was he a backup safety that got the pick on? Yeah. There's a couple backup safeties that, you know, again, the the quarterbacks through that third and fourth string quarterbacks through some some late balls that deserve to get picked, and they did. So, but Caleb Downs wasn't in for those for those plays. Yeah, he was first team defense. I think they got maybe two series or something like that <laughs> with uh, Will Howard playing. So, Vince, any thoughts from you or questions? Yeah, it's just really what you expect from Ohio State: elite uh, defensive back play, elite edge rushers, uh, really great wide receivers. Um, really funny that you guys brought up the wing T. Uh, those who listen to our podcast know that was like our every our favorite play, and we were just like joking they should run that formation every single time. Uh, we we have T-shirts uh, <laughs> uh, for that wing T formation to celebrate the Rose Bowl. Like that is how much we love that, and I think that is going to be a really great formation uh, formation for Will Howard and his strengths. He's a really strong physical runner. So to have him able to run two Ohio State running backs, uh, you know, the tight end, you can do, you know, the fake handoff. There's a lot of different things you can do with that. And you really force teams to commit in those uh, third and short situations, fourth and short situations. So I think that is going to be a formation that uh, you guys love, love running with Will Howard. And unfortunately, yeah, no, we were probably so not like. <laughs> I think so, too. Uh, they asked Chip about it after the game, and he said it's probably going to be much, much more of like a red zone kind of goal line run formation for him, um, which I think is how Penn State primarily used it, uh, yeah. whether on first down or red zone situations and stuff like that, or short yard situations. But yep. uh, we do have a comment here from Twitter. Coach Big Red says, Julian looked good even with that pick. Jake Ballard, I think he means Jaden Ballard, has – uh, brick hands, three drops with Julian. Yeah, Jaden Ballard was kind of all over the place uh, that game. He he actually went in with the ones, but then he was playing a little bit with everybody else too. It was kind of like they didn't know <laughs> what to do with him, which, you know, that's kind of been Jaden Ballard's career at Ohio State. It seems like they don't really know mm -hmm. what to do with him. It'll, it'll be interesting to see this uh, wide receiver rotation come, uh, come the fall. So it'll be uh, very interesting. All right, let's move on to our final segment here, the Michigan Sanctions. All right, so uh, I have, uh, you know, 
on Twitter, I'm seeing all the Michigan fans say, this is the hammer that dropped. And uh, you know, I see all the Ohio State fans saying, don't wait, it, or don't worry, it's coming. It's coming more and more. Uh, at the end of the day, nobody really knows what's coming and what's not coming. I tend to believe that there will be uh, you know, some stricter stuff coming because this was not the Connor Stallions uh, sanctions that happened here. These were the sanctions that came from uh, from the recruiting violations that happened during COVID. Essentially what happened with those is that uh, Jim Harbaugh uh, bought a cheeseburger. I'm sure everybody's heard that, has bought the cheeseburger for a couple of recruits. Uh, that was that's what kind of started it, but the real issue is that when they went to James, Fra or James Franklin, when they went to Jim Harbaugh, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get James Franklin in trouble here. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, yeah. Forgiven. Uh, when they went to Jim Harbaugh and was asking him about it, he acted like he didn't know anything about it, which, you know, they took his lying, you know, take it however you want. I'm, you know, I'm not going to take a side here. I'm just trying to present you with the information. And at the end of the day, uh, they did not, or they being the NCAA, did not like how they responded with that, and they didn't like some of the other stuff that was going on. This wasn't like Arizona State bad, where Arizona State literally had, you know, players on campus taking visits <laughs> in the middle of COVID, which that was a big no-no. Uh, but they did have, mm. you know, uh, coaches watching players work out on Zoom and some stuff like that, which, like, really, at the end of the day, it's it's really not that big of a deal, but it is an NCAA rule, so I guess you have to follow it. Um, one thing I can agree with Michigan fans on is that the NCAA is stupid, and I don't like them. <laughs> and I wish that they would just... T-shirts. Yeah. T-shirts. Yeah, we need our T-shirts. NCAA <laughs> stinks T-shirts. Yeah, that's <laughs> T-shirts. We'll start throwing them at the games and at tailgates. <laughs> you get one, you get one. Uh, but essentially, the penalty is here outlined by Ross Dellinger on Twitter. Uh, a three-year probation for Michigan that can vary uh, based on the circumstances sometimes. So when you hear probation, it's not always the same thing for everybody. A fine and recruiting restrictions. Those recruiting rest restrictions weren't exactly outlined, uh, but the fine, I forget how much it was, but it wasn't something super substantial. And then a one-year show cause for the coaches who were involved in the situation. All of those coaches have since left Michigan, so there's nobody on Michigan's coaching staff that will be affected by those show cause, uh, which to me makes no sense why you would give show causes to a bunch of coaches who are no longer around because you know they already have jobs for next year it's like they it's not like they were gonna get hired for this year so i mean we'll, we'll get everybody else's thoughts here but like i'll just share my thoughts uh first which is like what are you doing um like the ncaa just made themselves look even more um worthless than they already did um oh. put in a probation which like the probation idea is that like you can't do anything when you're on probation so that way uh, you get in more trouble, but guess what? You put the probation on after they had the whole cheating scandal stuff. So, you know, do the, does the probation, like, does it even affect the cheating scandal? I don't know. Like, to me, it's like you installed the probation after what happened before. So, like, I feel like it can't really go with it, but, you know, whatever, that's just me. And then, you know, a fine, guess what? If you take away scholarships, guess what? walk-ons can get paid nil and they can get their scholarship paid for so <laughs> that doesn't do anything um i mean i guess like maybe they can't go as often or something like that that would be a little hurt but i mean i shared my thoughts on the show cause there but um zach we'll let you go first on this man your thoughts on the sanctions or penalties whatever you want to call them uh let's start with this were these sanctions fair uh or did they get off easy it's oh gosh um i feel you yeah, I, I, feel like <laughs> yeah. I so I, i'll say this i i think if this were in 2019 which is not it's clearly not 2019 this would have been a, a i think a, a reasonable punishment and i i'll say this too i do think this could mean farce like that the hammer might be coming because, like, I, you know, I know the coaches aren't there anymore, but to say, hey, five coaches have show cause and potential violations and penalties for Harbaugh are coming later, which is at the end of this, right. for this incident, not Signgate, it makes me think that the NCAA is 
not going to run and hide like they have in the past. That being said, the NCAA stinks. They, st like, again, how meaningless is this? Like, it's just, well, we don't even have the names of the, I mean, I, I, I'm sure they're out there, but like, according to the report, like in the actual NCAA notice, it doesn't name the coaches. It doesn't actually name the recruiting restrictions. Maybe they're out there somewhere else. But like, this is the official, on the official NCAA website. And it doesn't have any of the stuff actually clarified. What the heck? And so I, I'm not going to say it's fair or not fair for Michigan. I'm just going to say the NCAA is incompetent because that's what this is. Yeah, no, I, I completely, I completely agree on that. It's just, and that's the other thing too. It's like, if this is a coach that is currently on Michigan's coaching staff, which it's clear it's not because they talked about the foreign ones. Like we, we have no idea who it is because nobody's actually getting named and nothing's actually happening to any of them. So, uh, the, so what's the actual punishment? Yeah, exactly. Like that's the, it's, it's, exactly. it's a nothing. It's a, instead nothing of a cheeseburger, burger. it's a nothing burger. <laughs> Uh, now that Vince, belongs we'll, on a t-shirt. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we'll go to you first, Vince. We've gone first to Andrew all night. So uh, let's go to you first, Vince. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so my, I kind of agree with Coach Franklin on this. He's said in his pressers, what's the point of having the rule if you're not going to enforce it? And, you know, I think this makes the NCAA look foolish, kind of like you guys said. And it's not really meaningful. Um, now, there are a lot of roles within the NCAA, but I was recruited as an athlete myself. And like my coach would say, Hey, I can't talk to you between these dates, like talk to you in a month or so. So like these coaches at that level, they know the rules and the fact that they're not really doing anything. It's really alarming, especially with the Connor Stanley and stuff with stealing plays like that impacts the plays for this year. And they still got to go to the big 10 championship. They still, got to go to the college football playoff and win in the national championship. Uh, similar to the New England Patriots, uh, Spygate, they didn't get their Super Bowl taken away. They lost like a draft pick or something. And that's just a, a little slap on the wrist. So if the NCAA does actually care, um, they need to really start, uh, you know, really laying down the law. Otherwise, they just look foolish. And like, really, if you're a college football organization, like, why not go outside the rules if you're not going to be punished? Like it, that's kind of the, mm -hmm. the message that the NCAA is sending. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you look at like places like Tennessee and West Virginia and stuff like that, or was it West Virginia? Uh, whatever the other school is that joined them in their uh, uh, suing of the NCAA, like those schools had sanction or had a uh, violations against them for transfer portal stuff. And, you know, look what they did. They took the NCAA to court and the NCAA is so incompetent that they can't even win in court. So it's like, you know, it's almost like, why doesn't everybody just cheat now? Because the NCAA, their penalties mean nothing. And they, I mean, mm -hmm. other than like, you get some bad rep on Twitter for a little bit, but I mean, you could do that from like grocery shopping at the wrong place. So like <laughs> at the end of the day, it really isn't that big of a deal. Andrew, your thoughts. Yeah. So I'm probably going to echo a lot of what all of you guys already said, but I think I agree mostly with Zach in that, you know, this is just, it was just a thing to do a thing. It was a nothing burger. Like it felt like a, a token thing that the NCAA can just say, Hey, we did something. Um, and that just seems to be the case with a lot of these, uh, you know, these kind of slap on the wrist types of penalties, if you even want to call them that, uh, that have happened over the last handful of years. So I think though, this still keeps the door open for something more severe to come with the Connor Stallion stuff. Like maybe this is like the first dish of what's going to be coming uh, with that. And that's really like when the hammer is going to drop. I, I would say that my confidence level that something like that is going to happen is pretty low because as we've mm -hmm. all uh, reiterated so many times here, the NCAA has proven time and time again, just how incompetent they are and how poorly ran uh, stuff like this is. Uh, but, you know, I still think that the, that the door is open there that, you know, maybe this was like, they're like, okay, we'll, we'll seed or we'll uh, give you that, you know, this was, something insignificant but the significant thing is uh, going to result in something much much bigger so 
you know, I think it's uh, just another case of like wait and see because um, they move really slowly. And uh, when they finally deliver, it's usually pretty underwhelming. Yeah. And also at that time, like Jim Harbaugh is already out the door and uh, you know, coaching in the NFL before anything happens to him. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's kind of the thing is like, you know, what can you really do other than like contacting the NFL and asking like, hey, can you please do something to Jim Harbaugh because he left before we could actually do anything to him? Like, there's nothing there's nothing you really can do. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously, there's gonna be Michigan fans that watch this and it's like, oh, I'll take that Buckeye. You've been saying this all off season long. I do think that, you know, the opportunity for the Connor Stallions uh, punishment is still there. So I don't think Michigan mm-hmm. is completely out of the uh out of the waters yet but at the end of the day like i look at this and I, it doesn't give me any confidence in the ncaa to do the right thing or to punish them the right way i mean in my mind this doesn't impact this season at all for michigan and, and like i can't see something that's going to majorly impact michigan going forward coming from the ncaa as much as i think it should and i think that there should be something that impacts them greater and possibly something to do with you know, uh, vi- or, uh, punishments of, you know, vacated wins and stuff like that. Like at the end of the day, like that still doesn't matter. I said this on the podcast months ago, like the NCAA can vacate this national championship, but guess what? That doesn't take away what those players felt. That doesn't take away the fun that the fans had. That doesn't take away the trips and the memories and all that stuff. Like all that's going to do is it's going to, you know, have one troll on <laughs> Twitter say, yeah, but it was taken away. It's like, okay. You know, Michigan fans are going to yep. say, I still felt everything. So, yeah, you know, what does it do? Well, it's, it's you know, we st- I still remember USC winning the national championship in 2004. Technically, it didn't happen. Exactly. But, like, I still remember Reggie Bush winning the Heisman in 2005, although he actually doesn't have his trophy, which is dumb. Um, but it's 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 annoying – just how like the NCAA was tasked to oversee this sport and they, they have done such a terrible job. And I think JR, you made a really good point that I want to highlight. You mentioned that the, that walk-ons could just get NIL money. And I think that point alone highlights how antiquated the NCAA has become because their sanctions are predicated on a past system and they have not changed. And that is maddening to me that they have not considered how to change. And and we've seen it across the board in college football. They have not regulated the transfer portal well. They've not regulated NIL well. And they still don't even enforce their own rules right. And even when they do, they get it wrong. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, uh, you know, Obviously, I think that there should be deeper sanctions here. Who knows? Maybe we'll see something more. Maybe this is setting it up for more. I know there was a little bit of language in there, like you pointed out, Zach, that, like, you know, something could be coming for Harbaugh and stuff like that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, this is – they got caught in the middle of the year and there's nothing the NCAA could do because they move at snail's pace, you know. (laughs) It is what it is. But uh, Vince, Andrew, any final thoughts from either of you on uh, sanctions, Michigan, anything like that? I don't think so. I just, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll wait and see. I mean, it's, uh, this is the story that, um, you know, it, it, it'll be amazing when the end of this saga actually happens because it seems yes. like it's been happening now for like five years. Yeah. <laughs> it does. It yes. feels like that. Yeah. Uh, it'll be I mean, funny I guess they... technically the COVID stuff, it has been happening for four. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Vince? Yeah, but it, it, it'll be fun at the end to see if anything actually does end up happening that's actually meaningful. Uh, so that'll be interesting. But, um, you know, I'm really excited for the, the fall football and, you know, the more exciting stuff and covering the players and stuff. So fall can't yeah. get here soon enough. Right. Just beat them on the field. Don't even uh, let the NCAA beat them. Beat them on the field. And make yeah, NCAA happen. cannot beat them. We have to do it, guys. Like Ohio State, Penn State, <laughs> we got to, like, you know, merge together and, uh, you know, <laughs> Beat the cheaters because the NCAA ain't going to do it. (laughs) Beat them dirty cheaters. 
Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, Michigan fans, if you're listening out there, let me be the first to congratulate you on getting away with the recruiting violations. Uh, you've done well. Uh, props to you. Uh, that's all I got. So, Andrew, why don't you tell people where they can find Nittany Blues Pod at? Love to. Yeah. So we are on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much everywhere that you listen to podcasts. Uh, you can find us on all forms of social media at Nittany Blues or Nittany Blues Podcast. And to learn more about the show, uh, listen to all of our previous episodes. You can also visit our website, NittanyBlues.com. Uh, like I said, all of our episodes are up there. You can learn more about Vince and myself. Uh, we also, like Vince uh, mentioned, we also have a uh, pretty you know, what we consider to be cool line of merch uh, that's specific to our show at shop.nittyblues.com. So you can check that out. Uh, we have some stuff in there that we pretty much guarantee you'll find nowhere else. Some some quirky little things, uh, some mentions from our show and stuff like that. Very, Very cool. cool. Very cool. Vince, you have anything to say about the podcast before we get out of here? Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for having us. It's been a pleasure being on. Awesome. Awesome. Zach, why don't you tell people where they can find Big Ten Football Talk? Yeah, so you can find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and as as kind of part of this college huddle amalgamation or combination or whatever we're calling this thing, uh, we're changing the direction a little bit. And actually, Andrew and Vince, this, this might include you guys at some point, but the hope now is every Monday morning we'll be uh, starting to talk with different podcasters across the Big Ten about kind of the state of the program and just what different questions about each program with within the conference and so i'm excited about the shift because here especially in the fall we're going to be talking about uh games recaps uh previews and whatnot and so why duplicate it when we can actually just go maybe more in depth with each program so i'm, I'm excited to start interacting with more of the the folks within the huddle and uh getting to interview them more about uh the, the fandom and, and the programs that they love. So very good. Yeah. And I, th I think the thing I appreciate about what you're going to be doing, Zach, is like sometimes when I listen to a, a podcast from another team, you know, it just seems kind of like a, like a glaze fest and stuff like that, where it's just like, this is great. We're awesome and everything. And, it, you know, I feel like when you actually sit down and have a real conversation about the actual program, you kind of get some of the more real stuff uh, that goes on there. So uh, I appreciate that. Of course, Nittany Blues Pod would never be like that. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> as a fan of another program, sometimes, sometimes it's hard to, to listen to that stuff and think, you know, well, you know, this, this, that, and the other. So anyway, uh, hey, if you are listening on podcast, please do stick around we have about a 10 to 20 minute uh recap of the Purdue spring game coming up after this if you're watching on youtube that is going to be a completely separate video you can look for that to be posted later tonight that was with chris from the bowler express podcast but if you're uh just if you're heading out at this point we appreciate you being here appreciate you watching have a good night everybody <laughs>